with the chatbots, many, many companies, but also people had bad experiences. There mm. were a lot of unhappy users. What do you think? When, when will we be able to, to talk to a machine and, and that that machine will understand, understand us and we will be happy? When will this be? Oh my gosh. Um, I mean, I think that, um, really broadly speaking, I think that that could potentially be closer to us than we might think. I think that the potential is there. Um, so like I had mentioned, like I think of, you know, sort of the conversational experience in sort of two formats. There's the output, what the bot is saying to the user, where there is potential for a customer to be dissatisfied there in the sense that if, you're, if your conversation design, particularly the information architecture is set up in a way where the user gets a response that isn't necessarily expected to follow in terms of conversational turn-taking, that there's potential for user dissatisfaction there. There's also potential for user dissatisfaction when it comes to, can the bot even understand what it is that they're saying. And I'm not, I don't mean that just from like a, uh, oh, we haven't trained that intent mm -hmm, yet. I mean that mm -hmm. from a, oh, the bot doesn't, hasn't been prepared to handle that variation or that version of the mm -hmm. language. So, you know, English, for example, I mean, there are so many different ways to speak English, you know, even yeah. just within, say, one country like the United States, let alone the entire world. In linguistics, there's a field called world Englishes that has to do with understanding the nuances of English that are spoken in different areas, um, whether that's in Switzerland or Australia or the United Kingdom or the United States or even India and the Philippines mm -hmm. uh, where English gets used very, uh, very often. And so, you know, if let's say, for example, you uh, have a BPO where your service center is in the Philippines um, and let's say you have customers who are trying to interact with the bot and they're using Filipino English you know, if you haven't trained the bot to understand those kinds of variations, now all of a sudden those customers can't use the bot. Um, so I think that, you know, when it comes to both sides, the input and the output, um, on the input side, I think that what we need to think of as uh, teams who are building conversational products is how can we build a robust enough data library on which we can train local intents for our bot or voice, and it's even mm -hmm. more complicated for voice, but at least for text-based chat to um, be as inclusive as possible for as many of the variations of English or English varieties that are as pertinent for our business as possible, right? Because like you can't tackle absolutely every variant of English yeah. um, under the sun. But let's say, for example, uh, we're a company who's who the you know whose customers are mostly from the southern U.S. Um, well, the way that English is spoken in the southern U.S. is very different than you know sort of how it's spoken in say the Bay Area, Bay Area of California, yeah. where many tech companies are based. Well, okay, if the majority of our customer base is based out of the southern U.S., then we need to make sure that we train the bot to understand southern U.S. English. Yeah, I understand. Um, and then when it comes to the output, I think that there's you know a lot of controversy around. Um, you know, sort of large language models. Um, it's hard to sort of see into them and understand how they're constructed, et cetera. Um, but I do think that when it comes to natural language generation, that we're seeing a lot of leaps and strides. Mm -hmm. um, I think the challenge there is to think through how do we actually constrain the experience uh, so that way it doesn't come across as creepy. So mm -hmm. if we think about models like say GPT-3, they are built and sort of trained upon human to human conversations, human to human interaction. And so GPT-3 might be able to produce using, you know, natural language generation, something that sounds very natural for a human to say, but if a bot said it, it comes across as weird. Like, isn't the weather great today? Well, mm -hmm. yeah, as a human, we can say, yeah, isn't the weather great today? Because we yeah. exist out of yeah. this environment. We don't live in the computer or in the internet 
you know, or on a screen, we live in the outside world. Yeah, and so for yeah, us yeah. to reference the outside world, it's not weird. But for a bot to reference the outside world, it's like, excuse me, you don't live outside of this box. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and yeah, so for yeah. you to be referencing the weather, like a, you can't feel things. B, like you're like you don't think, <laughs> and C, you don't live outside of this thing. So how could you possibly know aside from looking it up on some weather app based on where my geolocation? Um, and so the way I think of it is, you know, and I think uh, there's sort of a debate that goes on in terms of like, well. We need more visibility into these models. Yes, yeah. uh, completely agree. Um, also, like potentially, can we constrain the model? And then the sort of technologist side will push back and say like, well, we don't want to constrain the technology because it's going to hamper what it can do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't think that's a technology question. I think it's fundamentally a design question. Let the technology be powerful. But as a designer, how can you give it the kind of sort of the constraints or the uh, boundaries of the interaction so that way it doesn't necessarily come across as creepy? That's we creepy. have all of, yeah, yeah, like, you know, there's a reason why we have progressive disclosure in UX. Why would we not use it in conversation, you know, conversational mm -hmm. UX or conversation design as well? Mm -hmm. If we know that, you know, if 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 we know on the technology side that the weather where the user is is a certain value and we interpret that value as good weather, then rather than saying, oh, it seems like the weather is great where you are, or isn't the weather great today? If we provide the frame of the interaction to the model as to say, okay, mm -hmm. don't make a judgment call. Yep. on behalf of the bot don't you know as a bot don't say it, it's I actually think. like a playbook or like exactly. a yeah playbook for the bot it's also has yes. to do with its its persona and its way tonality yes. and how he talks and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 absolutely and one other interesting question here is the ethics part mm -hmm. so if if we talk we want to be inclusive mm -hmm. then we should actually also be inclusive um, to the bot itself, so yeah. we should we should actually be open to say or to 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 accept that a bot is talking like a human. But I know that this is creepy and weird at the moment, but might not be creepy and weird in ten or twenty years. And I think that I think that sort of firmly rests on the shoulder of design, where. Like creepy is something we can design for and design against. Like if you want to creep out a user, you can do that. You know, it'd be mm. easy. We have the information at our at our fingertips. So we can say, yeah, well, so don't you live in such and such? And it's like, whoa, like, I mean, you may know that, but mm. like, you know, like warm up the interaction first. And I think that's where the, pro the progressive disclosure really comes in, where it's like, um, it's almost like the interaction you're having is a box. And the human has the potential to go in and out of the box, but the bot does not. The bot lives yeah. inside of the box. And now I think the technology is at a place where the bot is aware of things outside of the box. And the, uh, the human user who can go in and out of that box isn't necessarily um, familiar with that with or that used to the bot fact, being yeah. able to re reference those things. And so the way I sort of see it is like, you know, you want to slowly reveal that the bot knows things outside of the box of this interaction, whether that's, you know, like if, if we're thinking about weather, rather than saying, oh, so you live in, you know, Tennessee, right? You know, it seems like the weather's kind of good there, uh, or whatever, you could say, where do you live? You know, mm -hmm. if you frame it from the, if, even if you already know on the system side, yeah. if you use yeah. a question, now if now all of a sudden it, the user has the power, you cede the control to the user. The to user the has user. the power to either yeah. answer or not. And if they answer, then all of a sudden references to where that place is are now okay because the user consented, they volunteered that information. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, if they don't, then it's like, okay, then don't go there mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the user hasn't granted it yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, again, all of that, that's not a technology question. That's a design question. It's a design challenge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good. And do you, do you see any differences between uh, US conversational design, AI, and... 
Europe. Um, have you experienced any differences there? Um, I just make an example from Switzerland. We have mm -hmm. the big challenge of our four languages. French, mm -hmm. Italian, German, yes. Swiss German, and even some more dialects and mm -hmm. retro manch. And mm -hmm. uh, I was building bots for, for government companies, for a railway company of Switzerland, yeah. Swisscom telecom communication. And you need to have all languages in place. Otherwise you cannot go productive. Right. So, um, I see those challenges with this multi-language part and yes. I see the challenge coming up that people speak German and put in some English words. Yes. As you said, the case in Malaysia where you maybe talk a language from there and then you just put in coffee yeah. and eat and yeah. foods. I know also companies who are developing NLP systems to include multi-language inside a language in inside a sentence yeah. but do you see any differences between europe and us or also with these kind of challenges and other challenges yeah i think in particular the multi-language part is probably the biggest um mostly because i think in the us how do i put this diplomatically i think americans think very um narrowly about language um, in that it's like, oh, well, you speak English. Done. It's simple. Um, like the way that I speak must be the way that everybody else speaks. Um, and it's like, no, not even in the United States do people speak English yeah. or use English in the same way, let alone the rest like of the world. Like Spanish in um, Miami or... I think, like yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Or um, like even in Canada, for example, because they also speak French and the, mm -hmm. particularly in, you know, like French Quebec, the mixing of French and English together, they are more likely to be, I think, understanding of that particular linguistic situation than Americans. Because in American English, most like, I think people who were raised on that language alone don't have necessarily an experience of working with or being in contact mm -hmm. with other people who mix, say, Spanish and English. Um, or even, you know, I mean, there are many immigrants from Asia. The the phenomenon that you're referring to is called code switching in linguistics, where you're switching in and out of, of languages. And I think that's a very difficult, but also incredibly inspiring thing to try and design for. Um, I don't think American, I mean, certainly from a legal perspective, there's nothing stopping an American company from producing a chatbot or going to market on just like their English, whatever it mm -hmm. is that they've de determined it is they want to support. Um, I think also there's like, we don't have GDPR in the United States. And so like we can collect all kinds of data and reference all different kinds of data and all this stuff that we don't necessarily ha see as much of that in Europe. Um, and so I think like those particular differences lead to developmental differences within an yeah. organization. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, in the US, you might have the, that data at your fingertips. In Europe, you might not. Um, you know, in the US, like, and I think that's where the creepy factor comes in in the US is that like, oh, we have the data, let's reference it. And it's like, mm -hmm, you may have the data, but you might not want to reference it immediately yeah. because yeah. again, that's where it comes across as creepy. You have to use progressive disclosure. I think that at least there's a little bit more of like um, some steps in the way um, mm -hmm. in Europe that might mitigate just straight up referencing a piece of data uh, without necessarily getting the user's consent. Um, and then, yeah, we, you know, I think that particularly in Europe, like, let's say, for example, you know, if you, even if you're a company that's based out of the United Kingdom, you know, if your main operations are in Europe and your customer base is in Europe, well, yeah, you have to be able to support French and German and Spanish and multiple dialects for all of those things, uh, let alone other languages uh, across, you know, the European theater. And I think that's something that, like, when I'm working with customers in the United, who are have their companies based in the United States, but they also have customers in Europe, that's immediately the discussion that we have that mm -hmm. I don't have with customers who are based in the United States who don't have customers in yeah. Europe, where it's like, okay, well, we also have to be able to support these other languages yeah. because they're going to interact in that language. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
interesting <laughs> yeah and um now also some some maybe some materials or or uh, links or um ideas you would like to share with people mm -hmm. who want to get into this field of conversational design and ai yeah. do you have any good uh, tips on 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 learning <laughs> yeah um i think for conversation design sort of holistically i recommend the book Conversations with Things by Diana Dibel and Rebecca Evanhoe. Um, it was published, I think, in the last two years and has, I think, from my perspective, been an incredible tool for folks who are trying to not just break into the industry, but also deepen their craft in conversation design. Um, they tackle conversation design from a multifaceted perspective um, that I haven't you know, seen mm -hmm. until they produce their book. Mm -hmm. um, they tackle, you know, not just voice, but also chat. They also tackle the ethics. Um, they also tackle, uh, you know, sort of the design process. Um, they tackle language inclusion um, and how language is sort of an extension or representation of, you know, your social identity. All of those things are wrapped up in mm -hmm. that book. So I highly recommend it. Um, Salesforce, we have a free educational platform called Trailhead. And so you can register for free. And there is a module for conversation design that we produced that exists there. So if you want to take a look at that, you can do that. Um, if you're interested a little bit more in sort of the linguistics of conversation, I highly recommend this book by Deborah Tannen uh, called That's Not What I Meant. Um, it is a book that is fundamentally about her work on conversational style and how, you know, the way that you speak is imbued with a style of some kind. We have to talk in some kind of way. Um, and sometimes those characteristics of how you talk can be um, idealistically in opposition with how other people talk in other ways. And rather than dismissing it, it's about sort of celebrating that variation mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, figuring out how to include yeah, inclusion uh, those different... and openness to how people think and communicate based on their mental uh, picture, right? That and like the how they grew up and the society mm -hmm. that they're part of and the social groups they interact with. But I think mm -hmm. also from a design perspective, it helps you think through how to communicate a system persona or personality or brand through language. Yeah. Um, so like oftentimes I'll hear teams that'll say like, oh, you know, we want the, the chat bot to be, you know, energetic. And it's like, okay, but what does that look like in the language? You know, we have a way to translate, you know, things like that you know, we want it to be energetic, we want it to be uh, approachable or whatever in graphical uh, representations. But mm -hmm. when the U when the UI itself is the conversation, is the language, how do you do that? What do you say? Do you, you can do that using punctuation. You yeah. can do that using uh, text stylistics. All of those things I think are important to consider. And conversational style is, I think, a really good foundation to start from. So mm -hmm. I recommend that book as well. Um, and for obvious. for business people who want to or people who want to get into the field more like high level perspective I would still recommend Conversations with Things by Diana Dibel and Rebecca mm -hmm. Evanhoe because I think they also do a really good job about tackling the business case of conversational AI and conversation design um as well as the process because I think particular if you're particularly if you're a product owner or a product manager who's not familiar with yeah. how, you know, this is your first time producing a conversational solution for your customers, um, like setting your own expectations as far as what is it going to take in order to go to production? Mm -hmm. How long is that going to be? Um, all of that, like, because this is not like your, you know, sort of traditional graphical user interface solution yeah. like yeah, yeah, yeah. the timeline could look very different depending on what it is that you're trying to do and I think that that book exactly. gives a good overview of okay what you know what are the possibilities and what are the timelines associated with mm -hmm, them mm -hmm. great so we are already heading to the end um, okay so maybe what would be like uh, nice to know about you is yeah, maybe what you do besides conversational design. Oh, yeah. 
what are your hobbies sure what, what are your passions <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think um, I've always had a passion for language. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I'm multiracial. So I grew up in a household where more than one language was spoken. And I think that's always sort of fascinated me. Um, I like to uh, learn, uh, at least I, I sort of see language as a plaything. Like if you're not having fun with it, like it's not that serious, you know what I mean? Um, and so like, if you're not having fun with it, you're missing out. So I like mm -hmm. to, you know, when I meet someone who speaks another language or whatever, I always like to learn a little bit more about the language and how to say things in it um, and just have fun with it. Um, I, in my spare time, I like to write song lyrics, um, which I think is a very sort of uh, like peripherally related uh, yeah. craft to conversation design. Um, I've been writing uh, song lyrics since I think I was like 12 or 13. So um, I like to do that. Um, I like to travel. Um, so the pandemic has been very hard in that yeah. situation uh, when it comes to to travel, but I love to travel and go to different places. Um, I also practice yoga. So I did a yoga teacher certification years ago um, and like to just sort of study yoga as a practice, as a way to sort of ground myself um, and learn about myself. So yeah. um, I think that's another hobby that I, I have. And um, I hesitate to call myself a gamer because I'm very bad at video games, but I like video games. Yeah. Um, so I, I'll, I'll play video games in my spare time as well, um, but I'm not good at them. So whenever I tell people that, they'll always say like, hey, so did you, you know, can you do this, that, and the other? Have you played this video game? And I'm like, look, I don't have that many opinions. I just play. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mm -hmm. just like what yeah. I like. Um, so that's a little bit about my hobbies. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, great. So... Uh, thank you a lot for for this interview, and um, of course. I'm happy to see what what uh, you are doing and what this Salesforce doing. I mean, you are also working on on metaverse topics, which is of course related <laughs> to to conversational design as well. Um, yeah, I'm really really looking forward to it, and yeah, happy to to um, share your know how on on Voice Tech Hub. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.